It was a crazy weekend when it comes to politics in the United States. Breaking news from the United States. President Joe Biden has just announced that he is dropping out. And a critical moment in the presidential race. And a lot of that has major economic impacts, especially in an election season. So as probably everyone is aware, two days ago, Biden announced that he would not be seeking re-election and that now the Democrats will need to find a new nominee for the Democratic Party to go against Donald Trump for the presidency in November. And the Democratic convention is only a month out, so it's gonna be hard for anyone to go up against Vice President Kamala Harris for the nomination. And they've raised dozens of millions of dollars for the Biden and Harris campaign, and the only way for them to keep that money in that war chest is for Kamala Harris to be the nominee. The campaign fundraising would kind of have to start all over again if there's another nominee. My fellow Democrats, I've decided not to accept the nomination and to focus all my energies on the duties as president for the remainder of my term. My first decision as the party nominee in 2020 was to pick Kamala Harris as my vice president. And it's been the best decision I've made. Today I want to offer my full support and endorsement for Kamala to be the nominee of our party this year. Democrats, it's time to come together and beat Trump. Let's do this. On behalf of the American people, I thank Joe Biden for his extraordinary leadership as president of the United States and for his decades of service to our country. I am honored to have the president's endorsement and my intention is to earn and win this nomination. Now as it currently stands, it looks like it's not gonna be hard for her to earn the nomination because everyone is pretty much getting in the party line to support her. But now raises the question in what today's episode is about. What are the economic policy differences between President Joe Biden and Vice President President Kamala Harris. We're getting a new lead of one of the two major parties in the United States, so it's really important to see what the differences are. Because especially there's not going to be a Democratic primary for the voters to pick the party lead, so now it's really critical to know what the differences are between the person they chose last time and now the person that's going to be put at the top from the party. So let's start with Joe Biden's economic opinions and what they've been over the course of his political career. In his early career in the 1980s and 90s, as a Senator Joe Biden was considered an economic centrist, you know, maybe leaning to the left a bit. He supported measures like the 1993 Budget Act, which aimed to reduce the federal deficit through a mix of spending cuts and tax increases. Instead of talking about doing something for small business, this plan actually did it. And it's pretty hard to find him begging for spending cuts now. Obviously, one of the things he wants to do is to not continue the Trump tax cuts in his next term if he were to have one, which which we now know he's definitely not going to. When it comes to banking deregulation, he played a role in the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999, which repealed parts of the Glass-Steagall Act and allowed banks to offer a mix of investment, commercial banking, and insurance services. But as we go to the vice presidency in 2009 and 2017, I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Things started to take a shift towards a more left-leaning approach. And the Obama administration was ready to invest a lot of money into the United States economy to kind of get it going. So when it comes to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Biden was instrumental in the Obama administration's $787 billion stimulus package. And it was aimed at combating the Great Recession through infrastructure spending, tax cuts, and aid to state governments. And compared to what he was doing in the 90s, he then supported the Dodd-Frank Act, which was aimed at increasing regulations on financial institutions to prevent a reoccurrence of the 2000 financial crisis. And then let's go to the past five years or so through the campaign running and his presidency. He was coming in as the COVID pandemic was kind of at its height. COVID-19, the disease that defined our lives in 2020. 2020 is now the deadliest year in U.S. history. And he passed the American Rescue Plan. This was a $1.9 trillion relief package and it was meant to address the economic impact of COVID-19. This is an insane amount of money, even compared to the economic stimulus of the Great Recession. The plan included direct payments to Americans, extended unemployment benefits, and support for state and local governments. And then he passed the relatively bipartisan infrastructure law in 2021, and it allocated $1.2 trillion, which was meant for improving roads, bridges, and broadband infrastructure. In general, both parties do support fixing our infrastructure, though $1.2 trillion is a lot of money, so it can be considered bipartisan at times, but for some, it was too much spending, especially at a time when inflation was starting to get out of control. But it is considered to be one of the most significant investments in United States infrastructure in decades, according to the White House. And then there was something that wasn't very bipartisan and certainly cemented him more on the left than his traditional centrist ideas 
from back in the day. And that's the Build Back Better plan. It was aimed to invest in childcare, education, and green energy to promote sustainable and equitable growth, according to the White House. And there was the Inflation Reduction Act, which was in 2022 and focusing on reducing the deficit, lowering prescription drug prices, and investing in domestic energy production and manufacturing. All of these combined together was trillions and trillions of dollars in new spending. And to be clear, it wasn't money that the United States necessarily had. The Build Back Better plan, it's a bad, bad, bad bill. So a lot of it did contribute to the deficit and national debt. In his early years, he supported various tax increases and spending cuts to reduce the deficit, as we already talked about. But today, he focuses less on the spending cuts and more for increasing taxes on corporations and high-income earners. And according to him, it's to fund social programs and to reduce income inequality. When it comes to health care, as vice president, he obviously supported the ACA, which was the Affordable Care Act under the Obama administration. The ACA wasn't perfect. That wasn't a reason not to do it. If you can get millions of people health care, and better production, it is, to quote a famous American, a pretty big deal. His current efforts are more focusing on lowering prescription drug costs and capping insulin prices for Medicare beneficiaries. When it comes to energy and environment policies, this is actually pretty interesting because back in the day, he supported some deregulation measures in his early career. But these days, he's leaning more towards investing heavily in green energy, aiming for significant reductions in carbon emissions and promoting clean energy technologies. For labor and minimum wage, his early focus was more on broad economic growth without specific emphasis on minimum wage. But today, he supports raising the federal minimum wage to $15 per hour and strengthening labor unions in his words to ensure better working conditions and wages. So broadly, Biden's policies have evolved from a more center-center-left economic area to now a more south-left or even sometimes progressive economic policies. And with that, now we can talk about Kamala Harris over the years. 2010 to 2017, she was California's attorney general, and during that time, she oversaw a housing and foreclosure crisis. He played a significant role in securing a $20 billion settlement for California homeowners affected by the foreclosure crisis. She took a strong stance against big banks, advocating for relief and remedies for those impacted by discriminatory mortgages, and of course, she was getting into office all as the Great Recession was getting underway. She also focused on protecting consumers in the consumer protection area, particularly those of color, from predatory financial practices. She emphasized the need for economic justice and transparency from financial institutions. Then in 2017 to 2021, she became a United States Senator. And for tax policies, Kamala Harris proposed a substantial tax cut plan aimed at middle and working class families, accounting to nearly $3 trillion. She also advocated for significant tax credits for low income renters. And when it comes to Medicare for All, Harris supported a modified version of Medicare for All, which would offer Americans the option to enroll in highly regulated private health insurance plans or a public one. And then there's the pandemic, and during that, she sponsored legislation to provide Americans with $2,000 in monthly payments and advocated for banning evictions, foreclosures, and utility shutoffs to help individuals maintain financial stability. Now, she's the vice president. I, Kamala Davy Harris, do solid. I solemnly swear. Kamala Davy Harris, swear. And she's continued to emphasize economic security, advocating for measures that support both economic recovery and long-term stability, especially for marginalized communities. That includes addressing systematic inequalities and pushing for policies that ensure a fair economic playing field, in her words. And, of course, green energy and infrastructure spending, aggressively promoting the green energy initiatives as a part of a broader infrastructure plan. And, of course, that aligns with the Biden administration's focus on combating climate change change in creating sustainable jobs through clean energy projects. But what interests me are more her shifts from broad economic liberalization to where she is now. Because she focused more on that economic liberalization and consumer protection, but over time her focus has shifted to include more targeted measures aimed at addressing specific economic inequalities and systematic issues. And over the recent years, she's also focused a stronger emphasis on strengthening social safety nets. So overall, Kamala Harris's economic policies have evolved from a strong focus on consumer protection and financial justice in California to a broad national agenda that includes tax reforms, health care, green energy, and labor rights, reflecting her expanded role and the pressing issues facing the nation today in the eyes of the Democratic Party. So let's talk about the differences specifically. Kamala Harris, when it comes to the wealth tax, she supported Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax proposed during her presidential campaign, which included a 2% annual tax on wealth over $50 million and a 3% tax 
on wealth over $1 billion. Then there's middle class tax relief, and she proposed the LIFT, the Middle Class Act, providing up to $6,000 per year to working families. When it comes to current President Joe Biden, the corporate tax rate, he had plans to increase the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%. In capital gains taxes, he proposed taxing capital gains at the ordinary income rates for those earning over $1 million. Income tax? suggested raising the top income tax to 39.6% from the current 37% for individuals earning over $400,000 a year. And there was middle class tax cuts and he supported expanding the earned income tax credit or EITC and the child tax credit. So in general, Harris's is a bit more progressive, but both emphasize tax fairness in their words and relief for the middle class while increasing taxes on the wealthy and corporations. Now let's talk about inflation, which is obviously a very hot topic in today's world. Kamala Harris focuses on wages and advocating for policies that addresses wage stagnation and income inequality as a means to combat inflation. And there's antitrust measures where she supports stronger antitrust enforcement to prevent monopolistic practices that can lead to higher consumer prices. She also wants to focus on improving the supply chain and emphasizing the need to improve the management to prevent inflationary pressures from logistical bottlenecks. For Joe Biden, currently he supports the Federal Reserve's actions to manage inflation through interest rate adjustments and other monetary tools. There's also implementing targeted fiscal stimulus to support economic recovery without overheating the economy. That was the initial hope. We know what ended up happening. <laughs> And of course, price controls in certain sectors like healthcare, because he supports measures to control those prices to prevent inflationary spirals. Though historically, anytime any country has put price controls on certain sectors, we know after those eventually are lifted, they eventually get to where they should be if inflation happened anyway. But next, let's talk about national debt, which is ever getting larger. Kamala Harris, she says she wants to focus on deficit reduction, emphasizing the importance of reducing the federal deficit, particularly through progressive taxation and closing corporate tax loopholes. She wants to tax the wealthy, supporting higher taxes on them and the corporations to reduce the national debt. Joe Biden has traditionally had a more balanced approach, aiming at addressing the national debt, combining tax increases on the wealthy and strategic spending, while also focusing on economic growth with investments in infrastructure, education, and clean energy that will help stimulate economic growth, according to him. So in general there, Kamala Harris tends to be more progressive with focusing on higher taxes, where Biden does want higher taxes, but also more strategic spending in certain areas instead of broader, large spending overall. Let's talk about healthcare and health insurance. Harris has obviously been a big supporter of Medicare for All, advocating for a single payer healthcare system that would expand coverage to all Americans. As discussed previously, she eventually revised this to a public option where you could sign up for health insurance through a government plan to compete with the private plans. Joe Biden has opposed Medicare for All. Instead, he wanted to expand the Affordable Care Act. And he does want to add a public option that would compete with private insurers. When it comes to the ACA expansion, he wants to focus on strengthening and expanding it to increase healthcare accessibility and affordability. And when it comes to healthcare and health insurance, let's talk about drug prices. Kamala Harris has been a vocal advocate for reducing prescription drug prices, supporting measures such as allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices directly, as most other countries in the world that have a national healthcare system do. She's also proposed capping drug prices based on international pricing standards to prevent price gouging. Joe Biden also supports the Medicare negotiation tactic, while also supporting price controls, essentially penalties for drug companies that increase prices faster than inflation, and supporting the importation of prescription drugs from countries that they were sold from more cheaply. So in general, Biden and Harris are pretty similar when it comes to the prescription side of things. But when it comes to overall health care, Kamala Harris tends to be more in the progressive wing, advocating previously for a Medicare for all system. But now they're both in the solid left camp with a public option. But let's talk about Social Security and Medicare. Again, Kamala Harris focuses on lowering drug prices through these programs by negotiating. And of course, price caps. She hasn't really talked more or proposed anything too drastic to sustain Social Security and Medicare. And same kind of goes for Joe Biden. These days, it's mostly political talk about the other side being the one to destroy Medicare, and then the other side says the other side's going to destroy Medicare and Social Security. So there haven't been any true proposals to extend those programs so that I can actually take advantage of it since I'm paying a lot of money towards it. That's decades down the road. We'll see if it actually exists by the time I get to use it. What's all that without private sector growth in the first place, honestly? So Kamala Harris, she wants to focus on green job creation. She wants to invest in the renewable energy sector. She also wants to invest in job training programs. 
programs, advocating for enhanced job training and education programs to equip workers with skills for emerging industries. She also says she supports small businesses and proposes initiatives to support them, which are significant job creators. Joe Biden supported the American Jobs Plan and signed it into law, which was the infrastructure plan aiming to create millions of jobs by investing in transportation, broadband, and utilities. Then there's manufacturing jobs, where he wants to focus on revitalizing those through incentives and investments. And of course, he also supports clean energy jobs through the Green New Deal. Not that it's called that anymore, but it's essentially been repackaged into different bills. And then there's the minimum wage, where Kamala Harris supports a $15 minimum wage. And she co-sponsored the Raise the Wage Act, which aims to increase the minimum wage gradually over several years. She also focuses on wage equality, where she supports measures to ensure that women and minorities receive equal pay for equal work. And Joe Biden is pretty much the same when it comes to the $15 minimum wage support. In April 2021, he signed an executive order to increase the minimum wage for federal contractors to $15 per hour starting in 2022. So they're pretty similar there, but let's talk about unions next. Kamala Harris has constantly backed labor unions and workers' rights and says that she supports legislation that strengthens collective bargaining rights and protects unionized workers. She also advocates for policies that make it easier for workers to unionize, such as the Protecting the Right to Organize or PRO Act. Joe Biden was the first sitting president to stand in a picket line, and he has union-friendly policies. He also supports the PRO Act and other measures designed at protecting collective bargaining and expand union membership. So again here, they're pretty similar. Kamala has historically been a little more left than Biden on this, but Biden has gone more to the left during his presidency and the campaign before that. Where they've had some differences are on bank bailouts. Kamala Harris has generally been critical of bank bailouts, emphasizing accountability and the need for reforms to protect consumers. She has advocated for stricter regulations of financial institutions and supports measures to prevent the need for future bank bailouts. But while Joe Biden was vice president of the United States, he supported the bank bailouts under the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. Sharp. And he says it was a necessary measure to stabilize the economy during the 2008 financial crisis. His current stance, though, focuses on strengthening regulatory frameworks to avoid the circumstances that necessitated the bailouts. Infrastructure spending. We kind of already talked about this a little, but in general, Kamala Harris focuses more on investing in green infrastructure and sustainable energy, while Joe Biden focused more on traditional infrastructure like roads and bridges, transportation, and broadband. Both of them are in favor of spending trillions of dollars on infrastructure. They just go to different places, with Kamala focusing more on green energy. But that relates to gas and oil domestic production. Kamala Harris has shown strong environmental advocacy and has called for a ban on fracking on public lands. And she supports transitioning away from fossil fuels to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035 and aims to end federal support for fossil fuel projects. On the other hand, Joe Biden has historically taken a more moderate approach. He doesn't support a complete ban on fracking, but has proposed banning new oil and gas permits on public lands and waters. His plan includes investing heavily in renewable energy and aims for net zero emissions by 2050. So again, here Kamala Harris is more to the progressive left, focusing on a more aggressive stance on regulating fossil fuel dependence compared to Biden's gradual approach. Now, a big topic that has already come up in this political campaign are trade policies. Kamala tends to focus more on progressive trade policies, advocating for ones that prioritize labor rights, environmental protections, and human rights. And when it comes to free trade, she supports renegotiating trade deals to ensure that they're fair for all American workers and protect domestic industries. And of course, there are more environmental standards, which are in line with her view on climate change. Joe Biden has had a strong emphasis on buy American policies to support more domestic manufacturing and procurement. When it comes to trade, he focuses on a strict enforcement of existing trade agreements and holding trading partners accountable for unfair practices. Then there's also multilateralism, where he advocates working with allies to address global trade challenges and counter unfair trade practices by countries like China. Next, housing. Kamala Harris advocates for expanding affordable housing options and increasing federal funding for housing assistance programs. She also supports rent relief by providing rent relief and assistance for renters, particularly during economic crises. And there's first time home buyer programs. Where where she supports initiatives to assist first-time home buyers, especially for low- and middle-income families. For Joe Biden, he focused on Build Back Better, which is a plan that included significant investments in housing infrastructure to create more affordable housing units. Then there are housing vouchers, where he supports expanded access to housing vouchers to help low-income families to afford rent. Then there are home buyer credits, which introduces tax credits for first-time home buyers and supports efforts to reduce racial disparities in home ownership. 
And finally, student loans, which has been a hot topic throughout this entire administration so far. Kamala Harris has advocated for significant student loan debt relief early in the Biden administration and proposed a plan during her presidential campaign so far to forgive student loans for Pell Grant recipients who start businesses in disadvantaged communities. And Joe Biden, he was initially skeptical about broad debt forgiveness, but after pressure, he eventually endorsed a plan to cancel up to $10,000 in student loan debt for most borrowers and up to $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients. But of course, his plan faced legal challenges, which was lead to a revised approach. So overall, when it comes to economic policies from President Joe Biden and current Vice President Kamala Harris, soon to likely be the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party, historically, Joe Biden has been more center left, but has been pushed throughout pressure or throughout his life to be more on the solid left spectrum of the economic scale. Kamala Harris has been anywhere from on the solid left area of the spectrum to the progressive left. So it's going to be interesting to see who she picks as a vice presidential candidate. It's probably going to need someone a bit more in the center to be more appealing to the average American, since historically her policies have been a little more on the far area of the spectrum. I want to know what you guys think. Throughout seeing both of their careers in politics, do you think they're a bit more similar or a bit more different? Where do you think Kamala is going to be when it comes to her economic policies compared to where she's been in the past? In about a month when we have the Democratic Convention, we'll see what their official platforms are. And if you like this kind of video, just let us know in the comments below. But I'll see you for the next episode.